Happy Mother's Day, everyone, and welcome to worship at New Hope United Methodist Church. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us this day for our online worship um, on this day when we when we celebrate our mothers. Um, and and uh, today is a day for all of us. It's not just a day for 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 mothers, um, a, not just a day for mothers in the traditional sense, not just a day for for those who have become mothers beyond the, the bounds of how we normally think about motherhood. Um, today is a day for all of us because all of us in, in one way or another have a mother. And so it's a day that we all get to celebrate. Um, and and uh, it's also a day when we come together to celebrate the God who mothers us, um, the God who has given us life, who has given us birth, um, and who, um, as we have seen, is, is like unto us a mother. Um, so today we are going to be um, reading the, the story of, of a mother in scripture, uh, the story of Hagar. Um, that comes from the 16th and 21st chapters of Genesis. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived for ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife. He went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked, on, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave you my slave girl to your embrace. And when she saw she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she ran away from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from, and where are you going? She said, I am running away from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for a multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. So she named the Lord who spoke to her, You are El Roy. For she said, Have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Therefore the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. The story continues um, after an interlude where Sarai uh, it becomes pregnant. Um, Sarai and, and Abram are, are renamed Sarah and Abraham. Um, and Sarah gives birth to Abraham's, uh, Abraham's son, Isaac. The child grew and was weaned. And Abram made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out the slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman will not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named after you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning, and took bread and a skin of water, and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. 
Then she went and sat down opposite him, a good way off, about the distance of a bowshot. For she said, Do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him with your hands, for I will make of him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, we know your love because we have mothers. We thank you for the mothers who carried us in their wombs, nourishing, protecting, and bringing us into the world. We thank you for the mothers who did not give birth to us, yet loved us just the, just the same. With gratitude, we remember their words of encouragement when we have felt unsure or afraid. We thank you for their kindness when the world has treated us unkindly. We thank you for their soft, comforting arms and the gentle way they kissed away our tears. We thank you that they protected us with the fierceness of a lioness protecting her cubs. We thank you for times when they corrected us rather than letting us continue down wrong paths. Help us to live so that their investment in us may not be in vain. We honor our mothers with lives of service to you in the name of the risen Christ. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. So, I don't know what it's like to be a mother. Uh, I, I, very clearly, uh, that is not part of my not part of my experience. Um, but I I did have a an experience recently that that kind of helped me begin to understand what it might be like. Uh, I was um, had had come up to the church uh, a, a little early before handbell practice, and and I had parked in the back to come in with with uh, our own Sarah, uh, our music director at the church, and. Um, we went in and, and we had a meeting and then we had bell practice and I forgot that I had parked in the back because it's just not something that I really ever do. And so I walked out the front doors uh, and then suddenly realized that the car was in the back of the church. So I began to walk around the church and, and as I walked around the church, I heard the, the cry of a young bird who was on the ground uh, underneath one of the trees on the side of the church. Um, who had, I, I, I think, had been blown out of the nest um, as, as the winds had picked up on that day. And so I, I called into Sarah, who was still in the church, and, and she brought me a pair of gloves, um, and I began the process of, of trying to return this baby bird, uh, who, who was very close to being old enough to be able to fly, uh, but, but wasn't quite there yet. Uh, still had a few tufts of... Um, uh, baby bird feathers. I'm, I'm sure there's an actual word for that, but I'm not sure what it is. Um, and so I, I, I pick up the bird, um, I, I get it in my hands, you know, just trying to gently cup it, and uh, it, it jumps out of my hands and it flutters for a bit and uh, safely uh, reaches the ground. And so this time I, I pick it up, and I hold it a little bit more tightly, and, and it, it fights me considerably. Um, but this time I, I, I managed to kind of wiggle my way up into the tree um, and and I, I, I place it in the nest. And just about this time, a, a great gust of wind comes um, before the bird had a chance to settle down. Its wings were out because it was trying to get balance. Um, and the, the gust of wind blows it out of the nest and, and it flaps its wings and, and, and flutters to the ground. So this third time I I, I tried to pick it up and, and once again it, it, it flew out of my hands and, and flew to the ground. Um, and so this time I'm just about to give up and so I, I, I bend down to the bird and I, I begin to, um, to, to stroke it uh, gently um, with my hand, my, my gloved hand, and, and um, I start to say, sorry little bird, I don't think that I can help you. 
And just about at this point, the bird hops onto my finger, flaps its wings a couple of times and, 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 and settles down, uh, grasping my finger as it would grasp a branch. And so I think, all right, I've got one more shot. So I, 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 I climb the tree again with a bird holding onto my finger. And, and this time it's much harder because I, I only have one hand to hold onto things. Before I'd been able to, to use my, my arm uh, that I was holding the bird with, but, but this time uh, that's not gonna work. So I, I, climb, I climb the tree and I, I put the bird right next to the nest and it hops off of my finger and, and settles down in the nest. It, it gets as low as it can to get out of the wind. Um, and so I got the bird back in the nest. And so I, I, I begin to drive home and I realize that there's this great feeling of sadness that has come upon me. And in honesty, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what it's about until I think that I suddenly realize that I've had to leave this bird. Um, there's a there's a, a sense where I I, I cannot, um, in any meaningful sense, be there for it anymore. Um, there is a there's a limit to what I can do, um, and now the bird is on its own. Um, and and it just occurred to me, suddenly that that perhaps this is a a, a little bit of what mothers feel for their children. And, and so I, I called up my mom and, and I told her this story and uh, with, with tears on my face, I, I thank her for everything that she has done, um, that she had done for me. Um, and especially uh, the way that she continued to support me um, after I had left the nest, so to speak. Um, and, and realizing how difficult uh, letting go must have been for her. Um, and I felt that in that moment that, that there was part of my mom that I was seeing for the first time. Being seen is so important. There are only a few things that we, that we have in common as human beings, and, and one of them is that we desire to be seen and known. I think that this is this is something, of course, that that all parents are familiar with. Because uh, who hasn't heard uh, something along the lines of, "Hey, ma, hey, dad, watch this. Look what I can do. Look, no hands, right?" Uh, children love to be seen. They say, "Look at me," and and your your heart may stop when you realize what they're doing. Um, but whatever it is, they want to be noticed and and seen and known. And I think that that is true for all of us at some level. Christian author and speaker Nicole Johnson was talking about being a mom and, and she said this. One day I was walking my son Jake to school. I was holding his hand and we were about to cross the street when the crossing guard said to him, who is that with you young fella? Nobody, he shrugged. Nobody? The crossing guard and I laughed my son is only five, but as we crossed the street, I thought, oh my goodness, I'm nobody? As nobody, I would walk into a room and no one would notice me. I would say something to my family like, turn the TV down, please, and nothing would happen. No one would get up or even make a move for the remote. I would stand there for a minute, and then I would say again, a little louder, would someone turn the TV down? Nothing. That's when I started to put the pieces together. I don't think anyone can see me. I'm invisible. It all began to make sense. The blank stares, the lack of response, the way one, kid, one of the kids will walk into the room while I'm on the phone and ask to be taken to the store. Inside, I'd think, can't you see I'm on the phone? Obviously not. No one can see if I'm on the phone or cooking or sweeping the floor or even standing on my head in the corner. No one can see me because I'm the invisible mom. Some days I'm only a pair of hands, nothing more. Can you fix this? Can you tie this? Can you open this? Some days I'm merely a clock to ask what time is it? I'm a satellite guide to answer what number is the Disney channel? Some days I'm a crystal ball. Where's my other sock? Where's my phone? What's for dinner? Hands, a clock, a crystal ball. 
but always invisible. I don't know if you've ever felt like that, but today, as we do on Mother's Day, we're going to look at a woman from the Bible that I think that we know, need to know more about. Uh, this is a woman who I don't think that we think about that often, but through her story, uh, hopefully we'll see a new truth for our lives. The story comes from the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 16 and chapter 21, um, which I have just read, but uh, let me set the backdrop for this story. God had promised Abraham that he would have a child and that that child would be his heir. But Abraham, when, when this promise is made, is, is in his late 90s and, and his wife, Sarah, is in her late 80s. And so it seems impossible to them. And since Sarah hasn't conceived, she tells Abraham to have a child with her servant, Hagar. Um, and, and, and by the way, if you have uh, seen or read The Handmaid's Tale, this, this arrangement uh, will probably seem familiar. Um, and I feel like I need to say that the, the Bible does not present this arrangement as a good thing. Um, this is a, clearly a lack of faith from Abraham and Sarah, and, and it's an act of abuse that cannot be excused. Um, and, and so I, I, f I feel like that needs to be said. But nevertheless, Hagar becomes pregnant, and Sarah begins to clash with Hagar. And, and we, pick, we pick up the story in Genesis 16, 6. But Abram said to Sarai, Your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she ran away from her. Hagar was trapped in this system where, where she was invisible. She, as herself, as a, as a human being, was invisible. She had no rights, dignity, freedom, or choice, and, and she's had enough of abuse. It's, it's hard to be a nobody. It's hard to be seen as just a tool. And she was just there to serve a purpose. And, and, and so she runs away, and, and, and in, in this moment, um, I, she, she realizes that, that uh, really there is no getting away at this point. Uh, she, she has no life outside of the system that she's trapped in. And as soon as she's had the child, uh, she becomes at, at once an object of scorn um, and also quite invisible. It's amazing how fast things change, isn't it? This week, uh, journalist Anna Malakia Tubbs penned an excellent piece for, the, for, the, uh, for Time magazine, and, and, and she said this, I was not fully prepared for how quickly I would be forgotten after birthing my own child. It is a feeling that many mothers in the U.S. know well. All eyes seem to be on you while you're pregnant, sometimes in uncomfortable ways, but as soon as you give birth, all eyes turn to the baby. You've done the most epic and exhausting thing, yet you're no longer at the forefront of people's minds. In fact, the more you agree to being secondary, to put everyone else, everyone else's needs ahead of your own, to let your child shine while you sit in the background, the more you are congratulated. It's a painful article to read. She writes about after she had given birth, she went to, to wash off in the shower, and with all the attention focused on the new baby, she nearly bled to death because no one noticed that she was missing or thought to check to see if she needed anything. She was invisible. It's actually a very familiar story in the United States. We have the highest maternal mortality rate of all industrialized nations. A woman is more than twice as likely to die giving birth here in the United States than, than in most of Europe, and yet no one seems to be doing anything about this. And the state of Oklahoma has long been one of the worst places, the worst states to give birth in. And we also imprison more mothers than any other state. And, and all of this adds up to an environment where everything is impacted. Listen to this. Tubbs, remembering her own mother, wrote, Everywhere we went, my mom would comment on the ways that mothers were treated. She often said, if a mother is treated well in her community, that community will do well. 
If the opposite were true, my mother believed that the community would suffer. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? How we treat moms, uh, not just our own moms, but all the moms in our community matters. When we make mothers invisible, when we praise them for their selflessness and forget to meet their needs, we all suffer the consequences. Which brings us back to Hagar. Hagar did not want to be some invisible person who is simply a vessel. And in a desperate wilderness moment when she has reached the end of her rope, she encounters the living God who meets her needs and extends to her nearly the same promise that this same God made to Abraham. I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for a multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. God tells her that she will be the matriarch of a great people. And so in verse 13, she names God. She says, You are El Roy. The God who sees. The God who sees. Isn't that incredible? If we could give God any name, what would your name for God be? Have you ever thought about that? Have you had the chance to name God? What would you say? The God who loves. The God who comforts. The God who leads. The second chance God. The God of grace. The God of victory whatever you choose would actually say about as much about you as it would about the character of God, because it's through our own need that we experience God in our deepest way. Hagar felt insignificant and invisible. She was someone else's tool, yet she's actually a very significant person in the Bible. Think about it. God, Hagar has the longest conversation of any woman and almost any man in the Old Testament with God. Hagar, the Egyptian maid, is the only person in the Bible who gives God a name. Up to this point, God gave God gave God self names. God called God self Elohim, the creator. Yahweh, I am who I am. El Shaddai, God Almighty, an image that conjures up uh, both the the image of a, a powerful warrior's mighty breast and the and, and the breast of a nursing mother. God Almighty, Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. These are majestic, if not always personal names for God. But we Methodists believe that our experiences, our, our experiences, our personal experiences are a legitimate way that we know about God. And so we can have these personal, intimate names for God. And Hagar, a mother who desires to be seen and known and valued and, and treated as a full human being, as a child of God, meets God and declares, I have met the God who sees me. Can you imagine the difference that makes in our life when we recognize that God sees us? God knows you. But are there times when we wonder if anyone, let alone God, sees us and knows us? It doesn't matter if you are female, male, if you're younger or older. I believe that we all have a fundamental need to be seen. Some of us know exactly what that feels like, to be overlooked, ignored, and forgotten. And hopefully we learn from that and, and we don't repeat that history. William Timaeus was a Christian journalist for the Kansas City Star. And he wrote, you really don't understand human nature unless you know why a child on a merry-go-round will wave at his parents every time around and why his parents will always wave back. Isn't that so true? <laughs> Kids will, will risk falling off the merry-go-round just to, just to wave to their parents. Why do we need to be seen? Why do we long for a God who sees? And, and what difference does that make for us? It makes all the difference in the world because to be seen is to be significant. It's to know our own roots. 
In Psalm 139, David wrote this about God. You, God, formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. My body was not hidden from you. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. God not only created us, God also saw us before anyone else did. In Jeremiah, the Jewish people were in exile, and, and God told Jeremiah in, in the 24th chapter, I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God for they shall return to me with their whole heart. And while the people were in exile in a foreign land, I'm sure they wondered if God still remembered them, if God still cared for them. Yet, that's God talking about his children. Hey, I am watching you. I still see you. I have a plan to bring you back home. Psalm 33 says, The Lord looks down from heaven he sees all the children of humankind. From where God sits, God looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. There's a sense of comfort. God sees me. God knows who I am. I am not insignificant. I am loved. In spite of all our insecurities, God sees you. God loves you. To be seen is to be significant. It is to be safe. It is to be understood, and it is to know that you are known by the God of all creation. And this same God also knows your deepest needs. And so later, when the time is right, God sees and reveals to Hagar water in the midst of the desert. God not only sees, but God helps us to see. God helps us to recognize that we all need to be refreshed. In order to pour ourselves out for others, we have to be filled up. And you can rely on God to fill you up. Just as God helped Hagar, a slave woman, find the path out of abuse and into freedom for her and for her child, refreshing her along the way that leads to life. I want to close by finishing reading the article from Nicole Johnson, uh, the, the first mom who I quoted who felt invisible. And she wrote, One night, some girlfriends and I were having dinner, celebrating the return of a friend from England. She had just gotten back from a fabulous trip and was telling wonderful stories. I sat there looking around at all of the others, all so put together, so visible and vibrant. It was hard not to compare and feel sorry for myself. I was feeling pretty pathetic when my friend turned to me with a beautifully wrapped pa package and said, I brought you this. It was a book on the great cathedrals of Europe. I wasn't exactly sure why she'd given it to me until I read her inscription. With admiration for the greatness of what you are building when no one sees. Johnson added, in the book, there was the legend of a rich man who came to visit a, a cathedral while it was built, being built. He saw a worker carving a tiny bird on the inside of a beam. He was puzzled and asked the man, why are you spending so much time carving that bird into a beam that will be covered by the roof? No one will ever see it. And the worker replied, because God sees. After reading that, I closed the book, feeling the missing piece fall into place. It was almost as if I heard God whispering to me, I see you. I see the sacrifices you make every day, even when no one around you does. No act of kindness you've done, no sequin you've sewn on, no cupcake you've baked, no last minute errand is too small for me to notice and smile over. You are building a great cathedral, but you can't see right now what it will become. But I see. Moms, on this day when you are the most visible, when you are seen and celebrated, God sees you. When you are at the end of your rope, when you feel invisible and overlooked, God sees you. 
and the God of seeing also opens our eyes, helps us to see the way forward into life. You are not invisible, and you will not be overlooked or forgotten. You have a God who sees you, a God who loves you and gave up everything for you. I do believe that if a mother is treated well in her community, that that community will do well. And so I pray this Mother's Day that all of us would help create a world in which mothers are seen and cared for just the way that God sees and cares for you and me. May it be so, now and forever. Amen.